Hello. In this video, we're going to look at some more related rate problems, and in particular some that are a little bit more advanced that require some more advanced techniques, some more insights and ideas in terms of how to solve them. So let's take a look at this first one here. A cylinder has a radius increasing at a rate of 5 feet per second. If the height of the cylinder is always 4 times its radius, find the rate of change of volume of the cylinder when the height is 12 feet. So let's start by drawing ourselves a cylinder. So we're going to go ahead and draw a cylinder. Remember, we need to label this diagram. And so cylinders have two pieces of information. They have a radius and they have a height. Now, what are we looking for? Well, it says we want to find the rate of change of the volume. So we're looking for dv dt. Now, what information are we given? Well, we're told that the radius is increasing at a rate of 5 feet per second. So dr dt is equal to 5 feet per second. And we're told that the height is 12 feet. So let's go ahead and write an equation. How would we relate V and R and H? Well, the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. Now, normally, we would go ahead and take the derivative right away. We'd have dv dt on the one side, and we'd do the derivative on the other side. But unfortunately, if you notice, we have two variables here being multiplied, r squared and h, which means we'd need product rule. And it's going to get a little bit too complicated doing it that way. Instead, it would be nice if we could get rid of r or get rid of h and just get one variable on that right-hand side. And in particular, we can because there's a piece of information that we haven't used yet. If you notice, it says the height of the cylinder is always four times its radius, which means the height must always be equal to 4r. This allows us to substitute in 4h. And so we get volume is equal to pi r squared times 4r or volume is equal to 4 pi r cubed. Notice we now have an equation that just has one variable on the right hand side. So when we go to do the derivative dv dt, we get 4 pi as the constant times 3 r squared dr dt. Again, much easier to do than if we would have had to do a product rule. Now, we have dr dt as 5. We need dv dt, but we don't have r, unfortunately. So we need to do another little bit on the side. We need to over here determine, determine r. Well, they actually gave us h, which is kind of weird. They told us h was 12 and we need r in our formula to plug in there. But we know h is equal to 4r. So 12 is equal to 4r, or r will be equal to 12 over 4, which is 3. Let's go ahead and combine all of our information to find dv dt. So dv dt is equal to 4 pi times 3, times r is 3, so 3 squared, dr dt is 5. So we're going to go ahead and multiply all that together. We want to be a little bit clever about our multiplication just because we don't have a calculator. So I'm going to do these 3's together. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. And I'm going to group the 4 and the 5 together. So that's going to be 4 times 5 is 20. And there's still a pi sitting in there. Now, 20 times 27, well, 2 times 27 will be 54. So this is 54 and then an extra 0. And we put the pi. So 540 pi is our dvdt. So we could say then in words, the volume is increasing because it's positive. Increasing at a rate of... 540 pi. Now volume is measured in feet cubed because the units were given in feet. So feet cubed 
per second. Let's look at another example. Object A is 15 meters east of object B and is moving due north at a rate of 2 meters per second. While object B is moving due south at a rate of 3 meters per second, find the rate of change when the distance AB, or sorry, find the rate of change of the distance AB when time is 4 seconds. Well, let's try to draw a picture here. We need to figure out what's going on. So we have object A and we have object B. So here we have object A, and object A is moving north. And it's east of object B, so object B is going to be over here somewhere. Here's object B, and it's moving south. Now what we want to find is, well, it says the rate of change of the distance AB, so we should probably draw this. D, the distance between A and B. And we're looking for, well, D, 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 T. Never use a lowercase d for distance because then your derivative looks like lowercase d, lowercase d, and that's just confusing. So we're looking for this. And, well, we're told something about object B and object A and how they're moving. Now, our diagram is a little bit spotty here, and so we should add a few more pieces. This is the distance which means there's going to be a portion x and y. There's going to be a horizontal distance separating them and a vertical distance separating them, and that's together going to combine to make our distance. Now, we're told some things about the rates, and so we, we need to figure some stuff out there. Object A and object B are moving in certain ways. Object A is moving north at 2 meters per second, so two meters per second, and object B is moving south at three meters per second. Well, what does that tell us about the rates? In particular, it tells us that object A is moving north and object B is moving south, and so they're separating from each other. If you think about it, after one second, object A will have moved two meters north and object B will have moved three meters south to make a distance of five. After two seconds, object A will be four meters north, and then object B will be six meters south, so that'll be four plus six, so that'll be ten. We can see that the distance in the y direction, the, the amount of y that's being created between A and B, is increasing at a rate of five meters per second, because we take that two and we take that three, and two plus three is five. So we have five meters per second as our dy dt, and we know the time is going to be equal to four seconds. Well, it looks like our good friend Pythagoras is here to help us. d squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Now, we could take the derivative right away, but we actually probably shouldn't have labeled it as x, because are either a and b moving left or right? No, they're moving according to the question due north and due south. That means exactly north and exactly south. So rather than calling this x and x, we probably should call it just a straight 15. Because the difference between them is always 15. Whenever we have a number like the length of a ladder or the distance between two objects that's not changing, we don't want to put it as a variable because it's not varying. So instead of writing it as x squared, we're going to write it as 15 squared. But the distance overall between them, and of course the, hor the vertical distance. Those are both changing, so we'll leave them as variables. Now we can do some calculus. So the derivative of d squared is 2d, dd dt, equals, well 15 is gone, 2y dy dt. Now we know y dy dt, so we can plug that in. Uh, we don't know capital D, we don't know a uh, little y. So we should determine both of those. So here's our little work on the side. Determine. Looks like this one and this one need to be determined. y and d. And they gave us time as 4 seconds, which unfortunately doesn't get plugged into the equation, but that's okay. We know time is equal to 4 seconds. And so using some basic logic here, maybe a little bit of physics or maybe just a little bit of intuition after four seconds, what will be y, if you think about it for a bit, 
y is increasing at 5 meters per second. So 5 meters per second times 4 seconds gives you 20 meters. So 20 meters of distance after 4 seconds. And if you think about that, imagine going back to A and B, it makes sense. They would be separated by 20 meters after 4 seconds. A would have moved a total of 8 north, uh, B would have moved 3 times 4, 12 south, so 8 and 12 definitely give 20. Now we can determine capital D using this equation here. So we know D squared is equal to 15 squared plus 20 squared. Now if you're paying attention, this is actually a 3, 4, 5 triangle, but we can go ahead and solve it using algebra. So 15 squared is 225, 20 squared is 400, that'll be 625, and the square root of 625 is indeed 25. So we plug in those quantities and we get the following. 2 times 25 dd dt is equal to 2 times 20 times 5. So dd dt is equal to 2 times 20 times 5 divided by 2 times 25. Again, I tend not to multiply out because I like to be able to cancel things. In this case, the 2's cancel. And then here we can see the 25 and the 5 cancel, leaving 5. And then the 5 and the 20 cancel, leaving 4. So rather than multiplying, we can just cancel, and we end up with dddt is equal to just 4. So answering in words, the rate of change of the distance AB is 4 meters per second. Let's go ahead and do another one. A water tank shaped in an inverted circular cone of height 12 feet and base radius of 6 feet. If water is being pumped into the tank at a rate of 10 feet cubed per minute, Find the rate at which the water level is rising when the water is three feet deep. Hmm, well, there's a lot going on here, a lot of moving pieces. Let's try to draw the picture first. So we have a water tank, an inverted circular cone. Inverted means upside down. So this looks kind of like an ice cream cone. Here's the circle part, and then the cone. Now, water is actually being pumped into this, so there's going to be a little water level in here something like that. So there's the water inside the cone. And we're asked to find the rate at which the water level is rising. So we should probably label the water level as h. So we can find dh dt. That's what we're looking for. Now we're told that the water is being pumped into the tank. As water is added to the tank, you can notice that we have a feet cubed. That's a big hint there. The water that's being added is increasing the volume of water. So we know dv dt is equal to 10 feet cubed per minute. Okay, what else do we know? Well, they told us at the end we want to find the water level when the water is three feet deep. So the rate of the water level increasing when h is equal to three feet. Looking back at my H over here, it's just so tempting to see a little mini cylinder, or a little mini cone, sorry, inside of the big cone. And so I'm gonna label this with a radius R. That's for the little cone. We have a little radius R for the little tiny water cone inside the big cone. And we can go ahead now and see that yes, we're definitely gonna be using the volume formula the volume of that little water cone is going to be equal to one-third pi r squared h. All right, so we've been able to find a formula. We notice that when we do the derivative of this, we'll definitely get 
uh, because of the H, we'll have a DH, DT, so that's going to give us what we want. On this left-hand side, we have a V, that's going to come out with a DV, DT, it's looking good. But we do have, unfortunately, those two variables, and we can't really do it with two variables. You can with product rule, but then you're going to have a DR, DT, and we don't know anything about DR, DT, so it's not a good path to go down. Instead, we need to find some way to relate these. And unlike the other question where they told us, oh, the height and the radius were four times, there's, there's really nothing here. If you reread the question, uh, we have a water tank, we've got the height. Uh, well, I guess we do know the height is 12 and the base is 6. We haven't used that yet. Uh, water's being pumped into the tank. 10, find the rate at which the water level is rising. Hmm seems like we should somehow use this 12 and this 6. And what we want to realize is if we were to draw just a, a little cross section of this here, if I was going to just look at this portion as a triangle, this is the big cone, and inside we have the little cone. Now we know this little cone has dimensions h and r because we've labeled them. And we know the big cone has a height of 12 and has a radius of 6. What we can now do is use similar triangles. Hopefully you remember similar triangles from grade 10. If you don't, I'll give you just a quick recap over here. This is how similar triangles work. If you have a triangle like this, which is 3, 4, and 5, and you have another triangle that is the same version of it, but just scaled up. And let's say this is 8, uh, and maybe this is 10, and you were trying to find this side C, or maybe I'll call it, call it X. You're trying to find that missing side X. What you can do is you can put the sides in ratio to one another. So you could say that, well, this 4 and this 3 are in ratio to each other. So maybe 3 over 4. And that ratio between the 3 and the 4 has to be the same as the ratio x over 8 because the proportions of these two sides have to equal the proportions of these two sides because this triangle has just been scaled up or scaled down. And then you can cross multiply and you'll get uh, 8 times 3, 24 equals 4x. Divide by 4, x will equal 6. So popping back to our question over here. We have some similar triangles between the small blue triangle and the big red triangle. So we'd have H over R equals 12 over 6. So we go ahead and cross multiply to get 6H equals 12R. But we do have to make a decision about whether we're going to plug in for H or we're going to plug in for R. Initially, you might think, oh, well, h is sitting right there. Seems like I should maybe divide both sides by 6, and I'll plug in for h. But let's think that through. If I plug in for h here, I'm going to have an r. When I go to do the derivative, I'm going to get dr dt. But I'm looking for dh dt. I don't want to plug in for h. I want to plug in for r. So let's rearrange it as... Divide by 12, divide by 12, r equals 6h over 12, which is h over 2. So we're going to take that and plug it in in here for r. So v is 1 third pi h over 2 squared times h. Make sure we do the simplification before we try to do a derivative. So this will be h squared over 4 times h which we could write as pi over 12, grouping the constants together, h to the power of 3. Now I'm ready to do a derivative. So let's make some space here. dv dt is equal to pi over 12 times 3h squared dh dt. All right, I'm going to go ahead and plug in for what I know. I know that h is equal to 3, and I know that uh, v is equal to, dv dt is equal to 10. So 10 is equal to pi over 12 times 3 times 3 squared 
dh dt. Again, I like to simplify as I go, so this 12 and this 3 can reduce to a 4. So I have 10 equals 9 pi over 4 dh dt. So isolating that, I get dh dt is equal to, I've got to multiply by 4 and I've got to divide by 9 pi. So I'm going to get 40 over 9 pi. So our final answer, the water level is rising at a rate of 40 over 9 pi. Now water level is measured in feet and it was per minute. So 40 over 9 pi feet per minute. Let's try another related rate problem, this one involving shadows. So a man 2 meters tall is walking away from a lamppost, which is 6 meters tall, at a rate of 2 meters per second. Let's find the rate of change of two quantities, A, the tip of his shadow, and B, the length of his shadow. So let's start by drawing a picture here. We're going to have a lamp giving off some light at the top of a lamppost. Then we're going to have a man, so he's maybe here. And we know the lamp post is 6 meters tall, so we can label that as 6 meters. And the band is 2 meters tall, so we can label that as 2 meters. Now, he's walking away, so he's definitely going in this direction. And we need to draw his shadow. The way light works is the light is going to make, well, light everywhere. And in particular, there will be a ray of light that goes like this. Now everything before that ray of light, everything here, is going to hit the man and be blocked. But this ray of light will get past the man. And so this portion here is going to be blocked and this portion is going to be lit up. So this portion right here is his shadow. We've also of course got this portion over here which is just the beginning of his walking, the distance from him to the lamppost. Um, and so we're going to need to label some of these quantities. Now. What are we looking for in the first one? We're looking for the rate of change of the tip of his shadow. So this is the very tip of his shadow. And so this distance here, we could call x. And so we're looking for dx dt. Now we're given that he's walking at a rate of 2 meters per second. What that means is that the distance from him and the lamppost, that distance between the two, is increasing at a rate of 2 meters per second. So that's not x. That's going to be a new variable, maybe x1. x1 is the distance from him to the lamppost. And we know that the change in that distance, because he's walking away at 2 meters per second, is 2 meters per second. This one, of course, is unknown. Now, if we're going to label that as x1, we might as well go ahead and label this x2. So this is going to be x2 here, which is the length of his shadow. All right, so a lot of letters there, a lot of different variables. Let's see what we can come up with. Well, we're trying to find dx dt, which means we need to relate x with x1 somehow. Maybe even x2, it's, it's hard to say. We need to find some relationship. Now, one relationship you might see is that x1 plus x2 is equal to x. And that's a great idea. If we have that as our relationship, that is true. x1 plus x2 would be x. And we could take the derivative. So dx1 dt plus dx2 dt is equal to dx dt. So that's good. And now we have dx dt. But we also have dx2 dt, and we don't have dx2. In English, this represents the rate of change of the length of his shadow, because his shadow is x2, and so it's how fast is his shadow growing? Well, we need to probably find dx2 as well, so it almost seems like we have to find a and b together. It's not as though question a comes first and question b comes second. Let's go ahead and see if we can maybe find dx2 dt, because we need that quantity. 
So now we need to determine, we need to determine dx to dt. And to do that, we're going to look at similar triangles. Because if you notice, there's a little triangle here between the man and his shadow, and there's a big triangle here with the lamppost. So we'll draw that right here. And those two shadows are similar, or those two triangles, I should say, are similar triangles. It's just a scaled up version. The big one is a scaled up version from the small one. So we can relate, in this case, it looks like the two and the six, and the x2 and, and the x, we're gonna relate some of these sides. So then the little triangle, which we'll draw in blue here, x2 over two would be equal to x over six. Okay, well let's go ahead and rearrange that. If we multiply both sides using cross multiplication, we're gonna get six x2 equals to x. Now in some ways we maybe should have taken this equation here and plugged it in here first. It might have been a little bit easier because it would have gotten rid of our x2. And you could go back and do that. You could plug in for x2 here and that way we wouldn't have to determine dx to dt. But what I'm gonna do is show you that we could just continue on. Even though we maybe should have plugged it in earlier, we can still make a save here. What I'm gonna do is take the derivative of this new equation. I'm doing a derivative again. So the derivative of this will be six dx to dt is equal to two dx dt. Or, in other words, if I was to isolate for dx 2 dt, I would get dx2 dt is equal to 2 over 6 dx dt, which is equal to 1 third dx dt. And I have now determined dx2 dt. It's right here. So I'm going to take that and plug it in to my equation dx1 dt plus one third dx dt is equal to dx dt. Well, I'm trying to solve for dx dt, so let's go ahead and isolate for it. dx1 dt will be equal to dx dt minus one third dx dt or dx1 dt is equal to two thirds dx dt. At some point, of course, we can plug in that dx one dt is two, maybe now's a good time. Two equals two over three dx dt. And so as long as I stay true with my algebra, I multiply both sides by three, divide both sides by two, I get two times three divided by two equals dx dt. Cancel the twos and dx dt is equal to three. So I persevered. I had to take a derivative twice, but in the end, I found the derivative of x with respect to t. I found dx dt is three. And so in words here, we could say, this was the answer to part A, which asked how the tip of his shadow, what's the rate of change of the tip of his shadow? So we could say, the tip of his shadow, his shadow is changing at a rate of three meters per second. Now let's go ahead and find the answer to B, the length of his shadow. So for B, we want the length, the change of the length. And if we go back to the original diagram we had here, you can see that the length of his shadow is equal to x2. So when we're trying to find question B here, what we're really trying to do is find 
dx2 dt. And we know dx2 dt from all of that work above is one third dx dt. And we know dx dt is equal to 3. So it's one third times 3, which is just 1. So we have our answer for b almost instantly. The tip, or sorry for this one, this is the length. So we have here the length of his shadow is changing at a rate of one meter per second. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this going out for a walk late at night, but if you are walking away from a lamppost, you might realize this. It's, it's a very neat phenomenon. Just to talk about the calculus here, he's walking at a rate of 2 meters per second. And what's happening is the tip of his shadow is moving at 3 meters per second. So if you watch yourself walking uh, late at night as the, the sun is gone and the lamps are shining, you'll see as you walk away from a lamppost that your shadow is actually moving faster than you. In this case, it's moving at 3 meters per second. And the reason why is because the length of your shadow is changing. If you do this during the day with the sun, it doesn't work the same way because the way shadows work and the sun and some fancy physics we're not going to get into. But when you're walking away from a lamppost, especially at night, you can actually see the length of your shadow will change. It's, it's quite a cool phenomenon. As you walk further from the lamppost, the shadow gets longer. And in this case, it was increasing at a rate of one meter per second. So I encourage you to try out this calculus next time you're going for a stroll late at night. Try to watch your shadow and see how it grows. Let's look at another example involving light. This time we have a revolving light near a shoreline. So this is like a watchtower or some type of lighthouse. So we have a revolving light located 200 feet from the nearest point P on a straight shoreline. It makes one revolution every 15 seconds. Let's find the rate at which the ray from the light moves along the shore at 400 feet from point P. So we've got our little lighthouse over here. And we know that it's 200 feet from the shore. So here's the shore. We're going to call this point P. So we know this is 200. It's not changing. The lighthouse isn't moving. But um, the lighthouse is revolving. And so it's light is changing. First, maybe it's over here, then it's over here, then it's over here, maybe it's out to sea for a while. And so we're going to draw it right here. And while it's revolving, we should probably add in some other, uh, some other variables, but we'll leave those for just right now. And we'll see what our rate we're looking for is. We're trying to find the rate at which the light moves along the shore. Well, here's the light moving along the shore. So that tells us we should add an x over here. And we're looking for dx dt. Now I need some way to relate these and of course I need to write down the other information I know. Uh, it tells us that it's going to move along the shore at a point 400 feet from point P. So I know x is going to be equal to 400 feet but I need a rate, I need a derivative, I need some way of, of getting other information from this question. And in particular, I'm told it makes one revolution every 15 seconds. How do I include that in my diagram? Well, if we're revolving, that means the angle is changing. And so I'm going to put a theta in here. Now, it's making one revolution every 15 seconds. So we need to say something about d theta dt. Now I encourage you to pause the video for a second. Think about how you would relate one revolution to 15 seconds in terms of a derivative. All right, hopefully you've given it some thought. One revolution has a total of two pi radians. And it takes a total of 15 seconds. So the angle is changing at two pi over 15 rad per second. Alright, now that we know we're focused on this angle, it becomes very obvious. We need to relate x and 200 and theta. Tan is clearly what we're going to use. Tan theta is equal to x over 200. We've got theta, we've got x, we're looking for the derivative of x, so let's go ahead and do derivatives. 
The derivative of tan is secant squared, and then t theta dt. Here we're going to get 1 over 200 dx dt. So we need to find something to plug in. We've got uh, definitely the d theta dt plugging in, but unfortunately we have this secant squared theta. We've got to plug in for that. We don't know what secant squared theta is. We don't even, don't even know what theta is. My goodness, how are we going to find this value? And you could try to find theta if you wanted. You could work really hard and you might be able to determine it, but I have some bad news for you. Because we're looking at a question without a calculator, you're not going to be able to do sine inverse or tan inverse to find that angle. And so we need a bit of a different approach. Here's how I'm going to determine secant. So let's move it over a bit here. We're going to determine secant of theta. I'm going to start with that equation like we usually do. So I have tan theta equals x over 200. And we're told what x will be. So we have 400 over 200, which is just 2. Okay, so tan of theta is, is 2. But this is where we get into that issue. Do you know in the unit circle what value of theta gives 2 from tan? I certainly don't. And so we won't be able to find theta and then find secant theta using that method of going straight to the theta. But is there a relationship between tan and theta? Or tan and secant? Or, or secant squared and tan squared? Is there some relationship here? And indeed there is. If you think back to pre-cal, you might remember an identity. A very unused identity in pre-cal, but very needed here. The identity is that tan squared theta plus 1 is equal to secant squared theta. Well, we know tan of theta is 2. So 2 squared plus 1 must be secant squared theta. So secant squared theta is equal to 5. It's almost miraculous how useful this identity is in this situation. We get this number 5 without ever having to find theta. And we plug it in over here. So that gives us 5. We know d theta dt is 2 pi over 15 is equal to 1 over 200 dx dt. So we'll go ahead and multiply dx dt is equal to 200 times 5 times 2 pi over 15. We need to simplify, so I'm going to cancel that 5 with a 15, giving me 3. 200 times 2 will be 400, so 400 pi over 3. So the ray is moving at a rate of 400 pi over 3 feet, because we're just measuring it in simple feet, per second. So for homework, you can try the Related Rates Worksheet, questions 1 through 12, and there are solutions for all of the questions on the pages that follow. Thanks for watching.